Culture Speaker Series. We meet every Monday uh, in the academic year, every Monday when classes are in session at this time in this room. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> if you enter the letters UCLA BEC into your favorite search engine, uh, you'll find our website. From there, you can navigate to the page that lists upcoming talks. Uh, at every talk, we circulate a sign in sheet. Uh, is that somewhere yeah. in the room? I'll get it. Okay. okay. Uh, we ask you to sign that so we can demonstrate to decision makers that there is a constituency for these talks. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, preview of coming attractions, next week we'll hear from Daniel Beneshek of UNLV They're talking about human maternal placentophagy. And then the following Monday, November 5th, our speaker will be Susan Schaffnit of UC Santa Barbara uh, talking about child marriage, in quote. In context, understanding the drivers of early marriage in rural Tanzania. Our speaker today uh, from UCLA's uh, Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology is Eduardo Guerra Amarim, and he's going to be talking about uh, barbarian migrations and social organization in medieval Europe, a paleogenomic approach. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about barbarian migrations in the Middle Ages in Europe. And uh, while I'm giving the talk, um, you're happy to interrupt me to, to ask any questions that you, you want. If something is not clear, let me know because of my accent or anything else, like more conceptually also, and I'll try to explain better. And um, so this work that I'm going to present today is uh, resulted in a paper that we published about a month ago in Nature Communications, and this, this is the title. And this work was done uh, while I was a postdoc at uh, Stony Brook University, and now I'm currently at uh, UCLA. And this was my advisor. This was another uh, key collaborator of us. He was here in, at UCLA before. Now Patrick Gears is at the Institute of Advanced Study. And those two guys here, um, uh, Stefania and Cosimo, are first co-authors with me. So this is a little picture of our uh, team. And uh, just a little bit about me, just one slide. Uh, I study other population geneticists and I study genetic variation to understand four aspects of evolution. One is uh, local adaptations in humans. For example, when a human go to um, a new environment, what happens with the uh, genetic variation? Um, another thing that I study is mutation rates. I use uh, humans and other primates as well. And here at UCLA, I'm studying the deleterious variation associated with uh, disease, for example, in dogs. But I also studied that in humans. And um, today, I'm going to talk to you about those fourth, about this fourth uh, aspect of my study, which is history reconstruction. It's where I use uh, genetic uh, diversity in human populations to understand uh, social and historical processes that happened in the past. And the talk is divided in three. Uh, parts. First I'm going to talk about the Middle Ages, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the technique that we use to study the Middle Ages, which is, which is ancient DNA, and then the last I'm going to talk about the paper, which is, should be about half of the talk. So let's talk about the Middle Ages, and just a curiosity for me, actually, uh, what, what do you guys think when I say Middle Ages? What type of stuff come up to your mind? Uh, some event or some characteristic, battles, play, play, feudalism, church, no, noble, feudalism. feudalism. Mm -hmm. I um, I am recently started to study the Middle Ages, and uh, I've been. That's a very interesting topic for me, and I've been asking people like, what do you think? I asked on Twitter as well, and did some some uh, research, and a lot of people talk about the disease, and, um, and the reasons that we decided to study the Middle Ages is because it's a very, very key moment in, it's a very important key moment in, in the history of Europe. A lot of the, a, a lot of the societies from nowadays, they, uh, they, they are, how to say, they have their origins related to this moment, like Germany and the former Yugoslavia, so those nations are directly involved with this period. Uh, and this period is also when the barbarian invasions occur, or the barbarian migrations, I don't know, there are many people who have different names for that, or simply migration period. So those, um, and also the Black Death, there was also another episode of the plague, which was in the, around the sixth century, which was the Justinian plague. There was also outbreaks of um, leprosy. 
And related to the Black Death, the population of Europe decreased in half. So 50% of the people died at that time. So this is a moment of, in Europe that a lot of transformations are, are happening in the biology of the, of the humans that are living there, but also in the society and politically and so on. So it's, a, it's, a, um, it's an interesting period to study. And traditionally, we studied this period using three sources. Mostly his history, which is uh, based on historical texts. And for specifically the beginning of the Middle Ages, when we have the barbarian migrations, this is greatly incomplete. A lot of the things, actually 100% of the things that we have written about those peoples were written by Romans. We don't have any text that was written by uh, a barbarian uh, group. So whatever we know about them could be biased and could be also um, wrong. Let's see. And we have archaeology as well, a lot of archaeology. But archaeology has, uh, it's, it's, it's a way to show links between cultures of different populations. But sometimes we cannot really say anything about the biological <laughs> relationship between two populations. So if two populations show the same customs, they, they for example, they have a specific type of sword or ceramic. <coughs> We kind of imply that those two populations are related biologically, uh, maybe implicitly, but in fact that might be true or not. And third is uh, anthropology, uh, physical anthropology. You can actually establish links between individuals, for example, and uh, sometimes you can also learn a little bit about the culture of the societies. In this case, I'm showing this skull that has, uh, it's an elongated skull. It's, it was something common at this time in, in the Middle Ages in Europe that women mainly would modify this skull. And this, this women will have higher status in the society. And obviously, if two women have this modified, modified skull, it doesn't mean that they are related biologically. So, let me see. Um, because of this, uh, we have a lot of, we, we know a lot about the mi Middle Ages, but the knowledge is sometimes incomplete, and sometimes it can be uh, biased. It can bias our interpretations. And if you Google Middle Ages, that's something that we see. So we have, uh, so if you, sorry, if you, if you Google barbarian invasions or migration period, this is a picture that comes up. This is from Wikipedia, by the way. So what you see is that there's a bunch of arrows coming from the north of Europe to south Europe, but also from the east towards Europe. And uh, the idea that we, at least I have and a lot of people have, is that, for example, this orange arrow here represents the Franks, and they're completely different from the Vandals that had the, 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 the blue arrow. And then the blue arrow here and this blue arrow here, they all belong to the same group called Vandals. We actually don't know if that's true because this is all classification by, from Roman perspective. And uh, that might be true or that might not be true, we don't know. So the idea that we see is that those are very homogenous people and they were uh, different people with the same name should be the same group. What, so, what are the scissors? I don't know what is a scissors actually. So it's their battles, their cross swords. Oh, uh, thank you. Ah. Cross swords. <laughs> okay. That's my interpretation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I never. Uh, I saw that, but I usually just skip that. <laughs> Thanks for noting. So we bring to this. Uh, how to say to this field of study, a fourth type of evidence, which is ancient DNA, and I'm going to write a DNA for ancient DNA just for, uh, to, be, to be short, and uh, with the DNA, we can actually establish links, bio biological links between two individuals and between different populations as well. And I'm going to explain a little bit better how we do that later. Uh, so, that's cool, right? Like, we have DNA, we can establish into a new population. Let's see if vandals and vandals are the same people or not, and, um, and so on. But, uh, we don't have a lot of things going on for ancient DNA in Middle Ages. This is a figure from a paper that was published about a year ago. And it shows the origins and the age of ancient DNA, human ancient DNA studies around the world. And each red dot, I don't know if it's clear here, but you see there is a bunch of red dots here in Europe and a very few other dots around the globe. And uh, this is basically what we see in any type of studies in humans. Uh, at least in genetics, at least. Uh, we see a lot of studies going on with uh, European populations, but not with populations around the globe. This is not surprising for us. The surprising thing for me, at least, is that if you only look at the blue part of the chart, which is uh, population, uh, let's say, samples that were collected from the last 
2,500 uh, years, all of them come from outside Europe. And here is, we see only like very few ones here in Europe, and those are not from the Middle Ages, those are from Iron Age. So in fact, we have this gap also in the genetic studies. I think it's better, yeah? So the blue one, you see like there's no, almost no blue here. So we wanted to fill this gap, and we uh, focused on this uh, culture called the Longobards. And the Longobard are those people that ruled Italy for 200 years, almost uh, over 200 years actually. So the end of the 6th century until the end of the 8th century. And they occupied this very big part of Europe, all indicated in red. And they, were, they coexisted with the Roman Empire there. So the Roman Empire was already declining at that point, but it was already it still occupying this region. And those people are thought to have left Scandinavia to North Europe uh, in the last century before Christ. And then they disappear from the written record for 600 years. And later they appear here, we don't know if they are the same people, but like, uh, at least the, the text described them to have moved from here to here in 600 years. And nothing between that. And here this region is known as Pannonia. It's a Roman province. And it today corresponds to Czech Republic, Hungary, Hungary and uh, Austria, of, uh, parts of those countries. Not of the whole country. So it's more or less that region. And after 100 years living there, they move to, to the heart of the Roman Empire, and they populate that, that, uh, that part. This, all this history here is written in this book here in the bottom. It's called The Deacon's History of the Lombards. And this book was written, oops, this book was written on the 8th century. So he's describing things that happened 900 years before his uh, existence. And he was a Roman. So potentially all those, those things are, are um, biased or wrong. Or, so uh, this is the type of evidence that we have uh, historically. And as I will show later, it, it's actually pretty uh, similar to what we find genetically as well. But uh, until now, this moment, we were like, OK, that could be good. That could be completely wrong. But that's a good start point for us to start to investigate the Longobards. And uh, so just this is one story that I, I read from this book. I didn't read the whole book, so, but this is in the very beginning. That's when they, they uh, actually arrive in Italy. So the king of the Longobards at the time, he was called Alboin. And he, uh, when he occupies north of Italy, he kills the local king, and he marries the king's daughter. And in their wedding ceremony, he offers her uh, wine in his father's escol. So this is uh, the type of story that we read in that book. And this is the, the, the uh, picture of this uh, that some painter uh, portrayed at this moment. And uh, to study these peoples, we had over a thousand samples from these sites and of course we didn't have money or people or time to do to study all of those so we focus on only two cemeteries and I'm gonna keep coming back to these names so whenever I say Sola it's a cemetery here in Hungary and whenever I say Coleno is in North Italy just by Torino and we chose those two because they represent the start and the end point of the Longobard migration that I described before, that happened in the sixth century. And those are the two maps of the cemeteries. Uh, just briefly, I'm gonna come back to those later. But here we have about 50, uh, both, in both cases we have about 50 uh, graves uh, from this Longobard period. And um, we are only focusing on the very first 50 years of occupation of, of um, Colenio. And we have uh, about other 100 graves from other periods as well. But I'm going to focus on the first in the very first. So now I'm going to come to the second part of the talk. I don't know if you, if you guys have any questions, just interrupt me. Can I ask a, a quick question? So for the, the sites, that you, the archaeological sites that you sampled, are they defined as, as Lombard? I'm sorry if I'm in Lombard. Yeah, Lombard, Lombard, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, uh, just by, by virtue of, of the material culture, or by virtue of time and you know where they are, and at you know at what time they were settled. Yeah, it's it's um, so there are. It's a, it's a mix of different things. It's it's te because of te temporally, but also uh, I'll, uh, at the same time there were other cultures there. So we identify Longobards at, at, until they come to Italy uh, with, based on the, the S brooch. So women would carry this uh, brooch in the form of a letter S. 
with engraved with some some stones and um, so then they lose that but they keep still the some sort of pottery we had that has some uh, specific kind of um, decoration so that's how we, we uh, identify those and um, yeah so um, just some, uh, the name Lombard or Longobard it comes from uh, the fact that they had long beards also. So that's also written in the text. So that's how the Romans would call them, because long beards. So ancient DNA. Ancient DNA is exactly like um, fresh DNA, but uh, we don't get it from fresh tissues. We get it from bones. <coughs> so we have to uh, go, we, we get bones, human bones in this case, and we uh, pulverize that and, and get DNA from that. Uh, um, this has a lot of problems. So uh, those are four of the problems that we have with ancient DNA. So first, the molecules are degraded with they degrade with time. So the mole DNA molecule is a very long molecule, and it starts to break into very small pieces, around 70 base pairs in this case. It's also subject to spontaneous damage. It works like a mutation. So we see more variation in ancient DNA than we see in modern DNA if we don't account for that. So it could potentially bias our results, right? So we see variation that is not really there. Third thing is that it's highly contaminated by bacteria. Sometimes it's like 98, 99% bacteria and only 1% human DNA. And the fourth thing is that may be contaminated by modern human DNA as well. So once we, there is so little DNA there that when I go there and or like the archeologists go there and they get the bones, they might be contaminating the, the samples with their DNA. So um, this is just like an extremely good picture of ancient DNA. This is more or less what we found in our, our samples, they're not very old. They have about 30% of ancient DNA. They have 69% uh, or 70% of bacteria DNA or other organisms <coughs> that are not um, human. And we usually have less than 1% contamination. This is actually a little bit uh, one of the highest ones. We have very low contamination. I'll explain why later. But uh, this is a very good picture that we find. And uh, one of the ways to control for that and to increase the, the success of finding human DNA in these bones is, to, is by uh, studying the petrous bone. The petrous bone is this area here in the, in the skull. And if you take that area and you, you look for the cochlea, which is more or less this region here, and then you will see if you, uh, the bone is usually very brown because of the earth, and it also indicates that it's full of bacteria. And once you, piece, once you drill into this region and you find this cochlea, it's a very hard bone, it's very dense, and you can, uh, you can see that it's very white, so like beige or white, it's very, it's very light. So it indicates that it's not exposed to the environment. So it's also less exposed to, to bacteria. It also less porous because it's very dense. So also bacteria can uh, come in through this pore, pores. So it's a very, uh, a lot of people use teeth or femur, but it's very good if you use the petrous bone because of those reasons. So I just put here a little summary. They are dense and hard. They don't, they, uh, they're not exposed. They contain more DNA. And they uh, also have more endogenous <laughs> DNA. So this is also like a jargon. Endogenous DNA means human DNA as opposed to bacteria DNA. So um, this controls for, well, this helps us to deal with number three and number four. And uh, there are other ways to deal with those as well. So number three, we can also correct with the bioinformatics. So I have the human reference genome and I align everything that I sequence from that sample to the human genome. Whatever doesn't align, I, I remove. So there's another way to treat that. And also, number four, uh, I, we can correct by um, using uh, ancient DNA dedicated labs. And this is one example. So this is one example, actually, that someone that did our, uh, one of our work. So he's writing this code, and he's using this, like, this glass box, where there is no air coming from outside to inside that is not purified. So there is like a, uh, a bunch of air coming uh, from, out, from in to out but always purified, so it, it prevents contamination. And um, the, the two first points actually I presented as a problem, but it's actually, it's kind of like uh, also good for us because that makes us discern what is ancient DNA and what is modern DNA. And I'll explain a little bit better. So one thing that I told is that the ancient DNA, they are smaller than the modern ones. 
And this is just a stupid example. I just put a big molecule that is modern and a small molecule that is ancient. So when I align, when I sequence all those, I don't care if it's long or short. But when I get the sequence and analyze in the computer, then I see which, are, which ones are small, which ones are largest one. I usually see two peaks in the distribution and I just focus on the first one and I ignore everything else. With that, I'm, I'm removing things that are for sure ancient DNA, but there are still things that are ancient, modern DNA that it's very small by chance. Not a lot, but there is some. So what I do is that I see that, that molecule and I say like, is it just like a bunch of contamination or is it ancient DNA? To do that, I align that to the reference genome and I call variants. And as you would expect, mutations, they usually occur randomly in the genome. So you would expect mutations to occur in that read that you sequence also randomly. If they don't accumulate randomly, but they accumulate more often, for example, a G2A transition accumulates in this end of the read, and a C2T accumulates more often in this part of the read, then you know it's ancient DNA. So the, 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 the ends of the molecules are more subject to this um, spontaneous damage. Uh, so that, that uh, some people say smiley pattern, I don't like that. So th this type of like, <laughs> This type of pattern is actually very nice when you see that. Say, oh, that's fine. This is ancient DNA. Oh, when you come across a <coughs> T or an A on the end, how do you know that it's due to a damage to the molecule and not just part of the original base pair? Yeah, we were just concerned about that yesterday. Actually, like we don't know if it's uh, it's if the individual had that or not. But um, we there are different ways. To, there are at least three ways to correct that we employ, but. Basically, one thing that you can do is just to ignore everything that is in the end. So, um, but you might lose a lot of things. And also these mutations are always transitions. They are never transversions. So there are different types of like C2A is a transition, but sorry, G2A is a transition, but G2C is not a transition. So you can also eliminate those because those are also more prone. They are the only ones that are actually spontaneously mutating. So. But then you lose a lot of variation as well. So there are different ways to, to, to correct for that. But one lucky thing is that this is only one read. It's usually 70 base pairs, OK? So the read is covering one position that it's variable. And you don't know if it's, um, um, let's say it's in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this part of the read. So you think it's a, it's, it's a damage. You don't know if it's damage or not. But you, you might be lucky to have another read aligning here, and, and then it falls in the middle. Then you have more certainty. And there are many algorithms to consider where in the read it is and how it is going to be called, as variant or not. Someone has a question as well, I think. No? No. Um, OK, so now let's go to the third part of the talk, which is when I talk about the actual work that we did with the Longobards. And uh, just a recap here, those are the people that I said like, ruled it for 200 years, and they came from North to South Europe. And uh, again, like I, I chose those two cemeteries because they, they correspond to the beginning and the end of the Longobard migration. And this is the map that I showed before, and here's some information. We have 45 graves for Solad in Hungary, and 55 for Colony in Italy. We generated two types of genetic data. One that we call a SNP, which is uh, a single nucleotide uh, polymorphisms, and we generate 1.2 million. And the other one is whole genome sequencing, <coughs> which is basically I sequence everything in the genome, if, if it's variable or not. And they give different kinds of information, but I basically use um, them as, uh, I will explain how I use them in the next slide. So this is a SNP. So we have, a human, we have three humans here, and they have the DNA. And Usually the DNA, most of the DNA between us is very similar. So it's G, 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 C, 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 A, A, A. And then you have a position that is variable. So this guy here has A, this guy has G, and this guy has T. When I look at this, uh, and uh, so the, the SNP capture uh, methodology is when I know that something is variable and I go then sequence only that part. So it's much cheaper. I don't waste money by sequencing everything that I know that, that, that shouldn't vary that much. But, I, but it could vary, so it's also important to do whole genome sequencing. So, um, so with that, when I, for example, I have those three guys here, and then I sequence someone else, and this guy has a letter A in that position. So the highest probability that this guy is related to this uh, purple guy and not related to the other ones. So the sharing of these variants, they uh, show 
who is biologically related to who? That in the population level or in the uh, personal uh, individual level? <coughs> and that's how we use it. And we use this type of uh, variation to understand three aspects of the societies. One is population structure. So are there people that are more similar to others than to others from another group inside the same population? Migration, which is movement, and uh, culture and social aspects, or more specifically, how those culture and social aspects, they relate to um, biological variation. And I'll start by talking about population structure, and this is the very, uh, let me just drink a little bit water. This is a PCA plot, it's principal component analysis. I think all biologists do that all the time. Basically, they show each little point of this is an individual, and when an individual is close to another uh, geographic, uh, let's say in the space of the PCA, it also means that they are close to each other genetically. And the, the, the larger circles, they are the centroid of each population. And I, you can see very well here, but it's only modern European populations here, okay? There is no ancient DNA. And here in the north part of the graph, we see northern European populations. We have Norway here, we have Netherlands somewhere, we have Belgium here. Here we have the Iberian populations, which is Portugal and Spain. And here we have southern European populations. Italy, Greece, and um, Turkey, sorry, Turkey, Greece, and Italy, for example. And um, this is actually, if you, I don't know if you realize, but it, this looks really pretty much like the map of Europe. So uh, it, that shows us that populations that are closely, physically, uh, I would say, geographically related to each other, closely, uh, that are close to each other geographically, they're also closely related genetically because populations that are um, close to each other tend to exchange more genes than populations that are far apart. So this is a pattern that we see in many of the different studies. So what I want to do now is to put my ancient DNAs inside this map. So if my, for example, ancient DNA1 uh, falls over here, I could say, oh, it cl looks closely to Latvians. If it goes around here, it looks a little bit similar to whatever the country is there, so, and so on. Um, and the way we do that is that we do a PCA for each individual separately, and, uh, and then we merge them with a method called procrustids. And those are the ancient individuals here, uh, the, the black scripts. And we can see much, I will zoom later, but uh, one thing that we can see here is that sample from the two cemeteries are mixed in the PCA space. They are 1,000 kilometers apart. One is in Hungary, the other one is in Italy. Although they are very far apart, they look very similar genetically. And this is one example, for example, uh, C comes from Colenio, S comes from Sola. They're all mixed. You can differentiate them as you, can, as you could differentiate Hungary and Italy. And the other thing is that they do not overlap with the countries that they currently are there. So, this is where Italy is, this is where <coughs> Hungary is. We see that no, no sample is in Hungary, at least they don't look like present day Hungarians, but some of them look at like present day Italians, but most of them not. And uh, that could be because of many reasons, we can discuss that, but uh, one of the reasons for that, and that's the one that we pursue, is that they uh, migrate from a similar source. So, and that source could potentially be North Europe because that's where those people look more similar to. Yeah, that, uh, so one of the questions that when we were publishing that the reviewers asked is, you're assuming that Europe didn't change in this time, in, in 1500 years, which is a possibility, yes. We don't know if that, that's true or not, but uh, Europe has, maintain, uh, when we use ancient DNA, there is a, um, there is a way to, to see if these shifts happen. <laughs> we have some sort of uh, northern ancestry, that is the hunter-gatherer ancestry, and we have the southern ancestry that it's more related to uh, the farming that came from through, through the south. So we can actually see if those things change across time, and it haven't changed it much in 1500 years. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you have uh, more than a million SNPs for these individuals, right? Yeah. Uh, and they, uh, they come from a SNP genotyping. SNP genotyping. Why did you uh, reanalyze modern and ancient samples together and you instead you projected? Oh yeah, I didn't do, so the way we do, 
We didn't project. I, I, I might have said that more um, as a, for, for, to make it easier, but what we did is that we, we, do, um, we do a PCA with how many uh, markers we have for that sample, and we get only those markers from the modern populations as well. And then we merge them with Procrustes, which is basically like trying to fit two, two, two or like 60 graphs on the top of each other. But um, we, did, um, we didn't project. So this is actually very interesting because it actually agrees with, with what Paul de Deacon described, that these people migrate from North Europe to South. That would be, uh, we were very happy when we saw that. The third thing from the PCA is that each cemetery, they, well, <coughs> each cemetery have <coughs> as much genetic variation as, as we currently see in, in Europe. So those cemeteries, they are very small. As I said, the solar is 50 degrees. And they were there for one generation. I'll talk about that later again uh, as well. But um, they have so much ge genetic diversity there. We were also puzzled with that. Like, how come that they have so much uh, diversity? So one thing that we do, oh, sorry, just so I explain, most of the variation in Europe, Europe we see from north to south. So within one cemetery, you see as much variation as you see in Europe from north to south. And uh, some people also complain, oh, but you are using modern samples, and those modern samples are forcing your ancient DNA to look like more north and south, but maybe they have a different type of organization. So what I did is that I only, so this is the PCA with the uh, modern samples, and I cut it in four, uh, sorry, three parts, north, central, and south Europe, and then I rerun the PCA without the, um, more, uh, modern samples. And what we see is that the blue guys here are always uh, in the top and the red guys are in the bottom and the pink guys are in the middle. So it actually, even without the modern samples, we see this structure north and south in the cemetery and we are not forcing that. So we took advantage on this north to south uh, climb and we estimated genetic admixture. So it's basically seeing which, what is the compo uh, genetic component of each, uh, genetic ancestry of each individual. That's like 23andMe or uh, Ancestry DNA. They do that for, uh, for modern people. So we did that for ancient um, samples. And what we see is that most of the ancestry comes from North Europe. Some of the ancestry, like one third, comes from South Europe, and some come from Iberia, but very small. And uh, this is, this is okay, fine. I started to put like who is blue, who is red in this, in this plot. And what I found is this. Um, the ancestors are not randomly distributed in the cemetery. So if you had uh, the blue ancestry, the north ancestry, you would be buried in this part of the cemetery, except those two women. And if you had the southern ancestry, you would be buried in this part of the cemetery. That's very clear in Solab. In Colenu, it's less so clear, but it's still you see some kind of like pockets. And um, I'm not saying that they knew genetics, but they knew something related to genetics that differentiate them. Could be something visually, they could look different. We tried to see if they had different skin color or eye color or something like this. We couldn't do that. They all have blue eyes. Uh, we inferred them to have probability. A lot of them had blue eyes and some had brown eyes, uh, skin color, they look the same as well, and for all the types of traits we couldn't recover. So it was possibly not something like that, could be culturally as well, so people were already joining this community looking different. And it could also be that those are actually two different cemeteries from two different times. And to test that we uh, did carbon dating, and we found that they actually from the same, possibly from the same uh, uh, time, and uh, there are some graves that came after them, and I'm not including them here, so they are temporarily clearly different, and some that came before them also. So we have that like, Bronze Age, and we have Avar, which are all the types of um, uh, barbarians, I would say, uh, that occupied before and, and later. So they are actually from the same period, and they were structured that way at that time. Were the uh, individuals in the Southern European part of the grave site, were they related at the individual level? Were they, you know, were they family members? Yeah, I'll get to that point. There is only one individual that has uh, only one. We didn't assemble all of them, okay? I'm just like putting the, the, the blue thing. So that could be one or other individual that I missed. 
But the only individual that has a family member from the southern group is actually this woman here, and she's buried with the other guys. So her daughter is here, in, right in the line, and she is here. So yeah, that's one thing that we don't see families in the blue and the red side, except this one. And uh, we were tempted to say when we were, well, when we were discussing with my advisors, we would say, oh, those are the, because they had servants at this time. They were also considered family in a like, social way, not in a biological sense, but, so they had these uh, servants, and people were saying, oh, maybe those are the servants, and then our team is actually, half of us are, uh, we are 24, 25 people, half of us are geneticists and half are not, mostly uh, archaeologists, but some historians, and they say, like, no, how can you actually say something about status? Although those, well, um, I'll get to that later, actually, but um, that's a surprise. But um, yeah, so we don't know why were they structured. We can't say that with genetic data, basically. The next point is migrations. And about migrations, I, have, I talked briefly about long distance migrations, right, when I said that they migrated from the north to south. Now I'm going to focus on uh, more regional patterns of migration. And, um, to study regional patterns of migrations, what we use is uh, strontium. I don't know how to say this word in English very well, but that's how you read. And uh, this element, it's in nature, and it has, it's an atom, and this is the uh, periodic table, so strontium is, uh, is here. And uh, <coughs> it's in nature, so, and there are two forms of this, uh, of this atom, the heavy and the light form. And, um, so the na nature has each each place that you go potentially have a different proportion of light to heavy, so and potentially not, don't vary also. So, but by analyzing the environment, you we, you get what you say. It's a strontium signature. So it's the proportion of the heavy divided by the light uh, atom in each of these elements. You can you can analyze water. You can analyze uh, soil or plants or other animals or, and, and also humans by comparing humans to what you find in the environment. By drinking water, when we are developing, our teeth are very uh, porous, let's say it's permeable to this element, to this atom, so we start to incorporate this in our teeth. So by drink, you know where the person was actually, uh, where these persons that we are analyzing, they grew up. Because you know where, um, how do they, so when you compare human teeth to, to the local range of strontium, you know who is not local. <coughs> So this work was done all by uh, Susan Hackenbeck in the University of Cambridge. <coughs> and some of the data we, had, we got from another paper. So I'm, I'm not directly involved in this strong team uh, uh, analysis. But uh, the data that she gave me is basically, uh, she gave me for each individual, so each point of these we have um, uh, teeth of a person. So some people we have two teeth, some people we have only one. And we have the, the proportion of heavy to, to light atom here on the y-axis, and here she, she told me who is a sub-adult, who is a female and male, and who is from Colenio, and who is from Solar. And by using the environmental samples, which is this column and this, she found out who is the uh, local, local range of strontium uh, ratio. And uh, the, the color here corresponds to the northern ancestry, southern ancestry, and when we don't have genetic info. So that's why, why the colors are uh, different here. And uh, the first thing we see here is that sub-adults, so children and teenagers, they are within the local range. And adults are sometimes in the local range, sometimes not in the local range. The other thing is that uh, most adults are not, at least in solar. And uh, the other thing is that northern and southern individuals have similar strontium signature. So no one is local and um, yeah, so no adult is local, actually, at least in Solad. They actually migrate together from the same environment. Whatever they were, we don't know where they were, but they seem to migrate from the same source. So if we uh, focus on those three observations, we develop this scenario where in Solad, both groups migrate together. They remain in Solad for a very short time, such that no individual that is born there reach adulthood and is buried there. So it shows a very, very uh, unstable or very uh, ephemeral uh, society that stayed there for only a, shor a short period and moved, moved, moved away. 
And in Colombia, we see something similar. Also, northern and southern individuals come together. They are not, the southern are not local people that they incorporate in the society, but they're actually coming from somewhere else. Except a few individuals, like three or four individuals are actually have the southern European ancestry and they are locals. And uh, the last point, part of the talk is about culture and social aspects. And that's what I showed before, the northern people, northern ancestry is here in the cemetery, southern is here. One thing that I didn't mention is that those guys look completely different from those uh, regarding the uh, material culture. So those guys have grave goods, I'll show some pictures, but like swords and uh, brooches and beads, ceramics, those guys have deeper graves. And those guys have, uh, the, their graves are all structured, they're not, those guys' graves are just like a hole on the floor. Those guys have uh, some wooden structures. Sometimes they have like a ledge grave, like this one. And this is the example of brooch that we find. Those also have a circular ditch, so that the grave is here and it's circled by something else. We don't see that in the southern part of the cemetery or in southern graves, because in Colonia we don't have this structure geographically, right? But the graves there also don't have those things. And these are types of weapons, weapons that we see. And um, there are two women that are in the north part of the cemetery in Sola. They have uh, jewelry. So she has beads and she has beads and uh, brooches. And that could explain possibly some sex bias uh, permeability, social permeability. But we don't see, we never see a southern man being treated as a northern man. But we see that in the case of women. We don't know what it means, but it seems that there is some sort of permeability. And just a curiosity, we also don't know why it happened, but this is the only woman that is carrying, in both cemeteries, that's carrying this type of um, implement. She has a bracelet. And this is not something that you see in Germanic uh, cemeteries. I might be wrong, but that's what my, the archaeologist said. So because of that, they call her the Roman wife. Uh, so the archaeologist knew that she was different before. And now we saw that she's um, not only different the material culture, but also different uh, genetically. And another thing that we can see with isotopes, and not with strontium, but with uh, nitrogen and um, uh, C, uh, carbon, is uh, what type of food these people have. So if the point here is an individual, if it's towards this part, is they have a lot of protein in their diet. And if it's towards this part, they had a lot of carbs in their diet. And the color is again blue for north and red for south. And what we see here is that there is a structure again in this plot, meaning that the blue guys, they had uh, better, they had access to protein, whereas the, the red guys had mostly access to plants. And protein is, is uh, thought to be a richer type of diet than plants. It's, more, it's harder to get and etc. So those guys, they had, um, a different material culture, they had different genetic ancestry, and they had different diet, which is very striking. And uh, the one, well, another, the last thing that we could we did with this uh, type of data is to reconstruct pedigrees, so family trees. And those are the two largest example of families that we find. We have three um, uh, generations. Yeah. And uh, this is uh, the, the blue individuals are the ones that have uh, northern ancestry, and the gray ones are the ones that we couldn't sample, but we could infer that this guy needs a mom, this guy needs a father, and a mom, and etc. And um, oops. the other thing is that family members are buried next to each other always. That also happens in Colonia. So those yellow circles are family members. Those are the the, the northern woman and her daughter here. And uh, so the, it, this is always uh, something that happens. And the other thing is that don't, we don't see a family, uh, let's say, a, a woman and a guy that have a, a woman and a man that have a child. And the woman, we have evidence that the woman was from one group and the father was from the other, uh, the mother from a group and the father from the other group. So we don't have this evidence that they, uh, this group actually in, uh, mixed uh, genetically. One, one thing about this family that we were very curious and we were, oh my gosh, it's so cool, uh, but we couldn't interpret what, what <coughs> is that happening, is that if you see here, the circles are women, and we only see one circle here. We see only men that were buried in the cemetery. 
So uh, we first we said, oh, where are the mothers of this family? We don't know, basically. Uh, we, we could, there are two samples that we didn't sample, and they could be the mothers, but that could be also some sort of uh, showing that the mothers wouldn't migrate, or I don't know what it is. But uh, that was something puzzling that we, we found, and we don't, just don't discuss that in our paper because we don't have a lot to talk about that. So just to conclude, uh, the two Longobard cemeteries are genetically indistinguishable, although they are 1,000 kilometers apart, which is uh, surprising, indicating possibly that there is migration coming from the same source. The two cemeteries, they have, they're both composed, each composed by two groups, and each group differ uh, in genetic ancestry, in material culture, and in diet, indicating possibly a social structure, and the third is that biological relatedness was an important structural element in the societies. We don't know if they were aware of that, but something related to biological relatedness was important to structure who is going to receive which type of treatment. And when I say biological relatedness, I mean genetic ancestry, so belonging to like ancestry groups, the same ancestry group, or first degree relationships, like parent and child. And with that, I would like to thank everyone. Those are my co-authors. Those are our funding institutions, and I would like also to uh, thank everyone who is here and the organizers of the back series talks. And um, this is the paper, and if you have any questions, you can ask me now, or you can also shoot me an email later. And I'm here, so yeah, you can talk to me. Thanks. So there is actually a gap. It's a little bit more complex um, than I explained. <coughs> but uh, so just one thing is that the, the two cemeteries are not uh, one coming after the other. We don't we don't see any relationship in one generation. We don't see uh, related people in one cemetery to the other, like uh, first degree related or second degree. Yeah. So they are yeah. about the same time actually. And um, so, but, but what are you asking me something different? As I understood, but so. Well, we like have it's, yeah. It seems like a long time for a migration. What were they doing? I mean, it's not. It's so. What happened wasn't like a group of people left the north with the intention of taking over. South yes. So there's a 500 year difference. I, I can't recall exactly what we have here, but um, what are the colors? But I remember. So th the problem here is that <coughs> when I say that the Longobards migrated from this region in the last century before Christ, and they reached here seven, 600 years later. What I'm saying is that I'm just repeating what he said, and that's what the, the, the myth the myth says. Right. But the myth was written by someone else. But that's not only the myth or the history that someone reported, but also we see we see the same S brooch in this in the <coughs> those two sites. But so people tend to think that people uh, cultures that have like very very peculiar uh, material culture they are they belong to the same culture. But that could be the case or not. But the, another thing that it's very hard to, to, con to talk about this moment of their history is that if they are the same people, they used to bury their, uh, to burn the, the deaths. So there is no ancient DNA here because they didn't use to bury them. So we have, uh, when they arrive here, they start to bury people. They could be the same people or not, but it looks at least from archaeology and from the history that people told, tell about those people, that they are the same people. But in fact, um, they disappear from the written record for, 16, so for 500 years. No one describes them living anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Just really quickly, were they Christian when they, by the time that they, they emerged and, and hungry? And that I don't know, actually. That I don't know. I think the 
I don't know much about the religion. Yeah. You're as Christian, right? Yeah, I'm just going to account for the <coughs> change in burial practices. Ah, yeah, it could be something. Yeah, that I don't know. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for a great talk. Thank you. Um, just a question. If they're migrating and you said that the myth was about uh, killing their king and all that, yeah. supposedly there was violent confrontation. Is there a difference in terms of uh, like marks on the bodies in terms of the proportion of dying from lethal wounds and stuff like that? Yeah, so I, yeah, so I, I analyzed, I tried to analyze between cemeteries and between uh, groups the northern and southern group, and I didn't see any difference related to that. So there are some injuries in both groups, but there are very, like, a very few individuals have injuries, not a, not a lot of them. So we couldn't actually test. It's, the test becomes uh, not significant. So we, our conclusions are that we cannot talk about that, um, about any difference, if there are any. The sample size is small, and yeah. So, but one thing is that the Longobard cemeteries are the ones that are more, they have the highest rate of weapons with men. So amongst everyone in, in the Middle Ages, well, the, uh, yeah, so amongst a lot of people in the Middle Ages, they have the highest amount of weapons. And those guys that I showed, I didn't, I didn't tell their age, but we see people that are early teenagers, like 12, estimated to be 12 years old, 11, 12, 13 years old, that they have weapons. It doesn't mean that they were warriors. It means that people portrayed them as warriors when they died. But uh, it indicates possibly that a war bellic theme was a uh, subject in the society, right? So we believe those people, and they're described to be very violent. What is the cutoff age for being buried with a sword? I'm just curious. Uh, I remember like 12, around 12 years old. I don't see anyone below that, but I have to double check. Yeah. But the girl that has, the only girl of the family, she has, uh, like uh, all the adults would have, um, yeah, w with, the, with the necklace. And the, the young guys, they usually have knives, but also knives, uh, I don't know if the, even the younger ones, they have some knives and some pottery. Yeah. Uh, you also, sorry. Uh, could you also see the missing uh, females in the southern uh, cluster, or was it also no, because they only we only have one family that is two female, so it's mother and child, and we um, we don't see a larger pedigree, so we can't really uh, there are no missing females that we, uh, right. we don't see. But they actually it's, we didn't sample everyone from the cemetery, right? We tried to, but we didn't get DNA for all of them. So they could be there could be uh, large families as well, but just by chance we only see families large families with the southern people, sorry, the northern people. So that could be also showing some sort of behavior of that society. We don't make any case for that, but that's something that we, between us, we discussed. So, I had a question. I was going to ask almost the exact same question. Um, so just to rephrase and summarize, what you found is a related patriline of northern European ancestry, and then there were no other related individuals, so just a large clustering of unrelated males and females from both northern and southern European yeah. populations. Yeah. So we also don't don't see relationship between males between across populations we don't see, but inside each population we see that this male line is more males are more present, let's say. Mm -hmm. But there are women there and they are buried together. I didn't show that, but uh, the first thing I think if they also are buried in a different place. Can you see the green guys are young guys, but they're all male, okay? So pretend that they're blue. So we have the blue thing here, only one girl that is this one. And then you have a bunch of red things here, red are, are women. So we have actually this structure where men are buried inside the cemetery and women are buried around them. That's only so lot. In Colonia we see it's, it's already, this disappears. Um, so there is something about gen, uh, like sex or gender, I don't know. But, um, but so that's yeah. the one where more of them had strontium that suggests that they were migrants to the area. Yeah, so we don't see any adult that has a local signature. So these are all foreign males who are, or a larger proportion of foreign males who are all buried in the central location. <coughs> the women buried in the circle. Yeah, there. but also the females are not local here. Right. So the like the whole population is not local except the children. Okay. 
showing that they were just moving by, right? Yeah. I think Julie had something. Yeah. Um, uh, so the way you have the spatial segregation in the cemetery of um, the sort of northern versus the southern, you sort of alluded to the idea that there is um, the mother, more southern population might be um, a lower social class. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to know if, it, if there were one um, evidence in this historical writing about there being like a servant class, or if there's an alternative explanation that isn't based on social class, but maybe um, a different cultural group or something. I was just wondering if you yeah. could speak to those. Yeah. So the. Um, Patrick Geary is, in the, uh, is the, the, the lead historian of this work, and he, we, he told us that, yes, they, they, were, they had servants. He's specialized in Middle Ages. So he, they had servants. And then we were tempted to say the servants are the guys that don't have weapons or jewelry, and they have like simple graves. And then everyone said, oh yeah, that makes sense. But then we said, we cannot talk about that. We cannot uh, write about that in our paper, because we don't really know, maybe the guys that don't have anything, they were actually the high status. It's unlikely, but, uh, oh, well, I think it's unlikely, but we don't have any, we don't know how those people, because status is, some, is how the society sees the uh, members of the society, right? And we don't know with that about with genetics. So in our paper and in our talks, I try, we try not to talk about those things, um, to conclude anything about that. But it looks to me, they had servants, we know that. It's just described that they had. And there is a structure, I would say, the southern or the servants? I don't know. Uh, how many cemeteries exist that have similar features? Or in other words, how, why were only two cemeteries selected and why Beeston? Okay, so we are now, there are not, there are, this year three papers were published in the Middle Ages, with genetics, sorry. So until now, until last year, we didn't have any paper focused on the Middle Ages. We could, you could have one or two samples by chance. But, so we are now learning about the Middle Ages, and uh, no one found this structure that I found. Uh, one was focused on hum uh, family relationships, and the other one was focused on this act, uh, skull modification. They were looking if, to see if the women that have skull modified, uh, the skull modified, they had different ancestry. Uh, and so they didn't investigate that. My paper is also the very first, um, it's the largest, my paper include the largest sample size per single archeological site. So before my paper, she's a specialist in ancient India as well, so I don't know if she, um, if I'm correct or not, but I, I think before my paper, people would say, people would have only two or one or four individuals per population. So it's very hard to find um, structure. It, it's, it's, hard to, it's not a population, it's just like a very okay. small, simple size. So my study, we tried to f change the, fo my, my advisor was the idea of my advisor, but we tried to change the focus from this very uh, broad scale migrations to something very small and local scale, and we tried to sequence the whole cemetery. So actually, there could be all the cemeteries with the same structure, but we don't know because until now no one studied them. But uh, how many cemeteries exist that that could be that could co correspond to Longobards specifically? Uh, we have um, we have some like thousand samples. I don't remember how many cemeteries, but each each of these uh, each of these green and blue things are one cemetery that we could they are associated with Longobards. And you, but so, you only chose two. Sorry? You oh, yeah. So we chose those two because of the beginning and end of the of the migration. If we had samples from the one in the north, they have cemeteries there, but they have just like a uh, they were they burn people, so we don't have bones. We have only the material culture. Uh, so we couldn't get DNA from there, otherwise we would have gotten. But then we, we just said let's focus on two cemeteries and see this broader scale migration, but also some things uh, inside each one of them. What we're doing now is, well, I'm not involved anymore in this project, but what we're doing is that we, Kolene was occupied for 200 years, more or less, and um, we have samples from uh, three periods of occupation. We divided those 200 years in three point, time points, and we only analyzed the very first one because we wanted to see the relationship, we wanted to find relationship between those two cemeteries. 
And now what they do is that we found that there is a structure. This structure is kept uh, throughout the time or not? That's one question that we're trying. They are trying to to address. The other thing is that we are not focusing anymore in, in Longobards. We are focusing on other cemeteries in Hungary. And there is DNA for those cemeteries, and they're no longer part. So we are also trying to see if this structure exists there. So they are earlier period from those ones that we're analyzing here, and we will see this in the next few years, I would hope. Purely out of curiosity, how do you get permission to dig up a, a cemetery? So I, <laughs> we, I'm currently working with another cemetery, and it was, um, I'm not sure how those things work. I think for Native Americans, uh, you need a lot of um, authorization because people, uh, modern people, they know that they are related to those bones, to, to the society that those bones belong to. So we, you need author authorization of a modern society that's linked to that. But in case of Europe, also specifically, one time I was talking to my advisor, because a lot of, in, the, in these talks, people would say, what about, okay, you describe what happened until now, what happened later, where is the Longobard genes right now? And it's so like, let's don't go there, because then, <laughs> if we go there, <laughs> everything, yeah. <laughs> he, he didn't want to go there, basically. Uh, but we have two, we work together with two big groups of archaeologists. One is, resp I don't like to talk about that, like, it looks like they own the, the samples, so we have to talk to them to get the samples. Mm -hmm. I don't think they own, I'm not saying they own, but um, we have to talk to the people that actually, the scholars, the archaeologists that actually, quote unquote, won't own the samples. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you.